Hello and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration and Crestorio 2, where, as you can see, we seem to be having a bit of a bot frenzy going on. So let's take a look into that, and also some of the other bits and pieces that have been built up around the uh, factory in the last stream. And top of the list, well, the cause of this bot frenzy is that, so, a little while ago, we decided that there's no point in using uh, delivery cannons anymore. So we did, we've moved, moved on from those, we've got spaceships running everywhere now, so we're carrying all of our resources around by spaceship in, in every direction. However, there's still various places left on the planet, or at least there were various places left on the planet, where we, where we had loads of delivery cannons set up that we just hadn't removed yet. And this one, for example, is pulling in uh, iron and copper and steel and sulfur and so on up here. And this was sending it off to the various outposts where we needed to have anti meteorite ammunition so we could protect them from the meteors and that's now being taken out by spaceship as I say so instead of shipping all of this out by um, by delivery cannon well we can just rip it all back up again and the thing is though there's in, in these chests we've got well we don't actually we're down to about a hundred uh, delivery cannon capsules left here because we've spent quite a bit of time and as previously mentioned a bit of a bot frenzy on taking all of the, all of that away but previously there was a huge stockpile of them here because we'd have a train come in drop a load off and then clear off to, to, to wherever and those are being made what's, what's going on down here okay we had rare metals being brought in as well and somewhere somewhere around there was a there was a factory facility that was also making the uh, delivery cannons in large in large quantities and so mark has been going around ripping up all of those areas like the like this and then just and, and it's all getting brought back down over to here and dumped currently it's all being dumped into the uh, warehouses of shame so if we look in these you can see over there on the right hand side that we currently have 25,000 delivery cannon capsules all uh, all locked up in these in these warehouses and in the rest of the logistic system and that's not including all the ones that are being carried down by the bots at the moment that's just the ones that are in in, in these uh, in these individual boxes so there's a huge amount of stuff being dumped in here however we're not just keeping it here forever we are actually dealing with it and so over here we have a disposal system so Crastorio 2 gives you lots and lots of recipes for turning items into nothingness so essentially they are ways of just turning turning things you don't want into into scrap however they're not 100% effective so here you can see we feed a delivery cannon into a into a crusher it turns into 75% chance of a delivery cannon so one time in four it'll actually destroy that capsule the other three times it'll return it and so Mark has set the system up here with these logistics chests and so the machine the system will, will take a whatever out of here and as you can see at the moment we are trying to dispose of both the uh, small wood electric poles and the delivery cannon capsules. They get put into a machine, it, it chomps down for a little while and then well there's a 75% there's chance it'll just spit it back out again and at that point it's putting it into a purple chest here which means that then another bot will come along, we'll take it away and we'll put it back into the warehouses of shame back down here. From there, it will then be brought back out again and put into a blue chest to be destroyed again. So I kind of wonder why he didn't just move these out a little bit further like uh, this. And then um, get rid of that, I suppose, as well. And that. And that. And we'll need to move the pylon down a bit as well. So put pylon in there. And then we could put in... in th then, in theory, we could put in a request to strong box like that. And we'd have these both feed in and out of it. Uh, and once it's placed, we'd have to, we'd have to copy over the, um, the instructions to it as well. The problem with this is, granted, is that we don't have any um, any blue strong boxes available, but we, we could make those. And doing that, okay, you'd have to spread out the, um, the the crushers a little bit, but this would at least mean that then we pass the stuff in and out. We wouldn't have the same problem with the with the uh, everything being double handled, taken away, brought back out again. I think that would be somewhat better, but but we don't. We do, we're just doing this. And then, to be honest, it doesn't really matter. We have we have a sufficient supply of bots. We have time. We can do, we can just leave it running, and eventually those twenty five thousand uh, delivery cannon caps, twenty six thousand now, it's gone up. 26,000 delivery cannon capsules will eventually be chewed through and, and destroyed and, and, and up here. Um, but we'll we'll lose slightly more logistics bots. It, it's not the end of the world either way, really, to be honest. This this would have seemed like a slightly cleaner design. And so the point of this is that we're going, then going to be able to use this to get rid of anything we want, anything we have an excess quantity of, that we want to just straight up delete. And this, I'm sure I'm sure there's more stuff in down here. Like, for example, all of these gas power stations. These are all a holdover from when we were doing the, the free power in uh, right back at the beginning of the uh, uh, beginning of the game. So we needed enormous quantities of gas power stations and fuel refineries to turn wood into, um, into fuel, into methanol, I think it was, which we could then burn to generate power. And so we don't need these anymore. So we've, we've got, we've ended up with about 2,000 of them sat in here. And then, and and almost 2,000 of the um, of the fuel refineries as well. So the, as I say, there's there's lots of things in here that we just straight up don't need anymore that we might be able to get rid of. And there's steel. There's a load of steel furnaces in here, 1,100 of them that we used to use. But then since then we've moved on to electric furnaces and industrial furnaces and then advanced furnaces. And those don't seem to be telescopic recipes. So we haven't ended up using them up. So they're just sitting languishing in the warehouses of shame down here. And so having this system is going to allow us to chew, chew, chew through that. 
Now, a little bit, a part of me feels a little bit dirty for having this in here because so far we've done quite well on not voiding stuff in general. So even though, even looking over in the um, in, in the core, core processing area over here, none of this none of this is getting voided. We're, we're, yes, we're turning some of it into into landfill, some of it into matter, uh, and so on. But other than some of the sort of some of the liquids like the, um, the the mineral water and some of the water, yes, okay, we're voiding those, but they don't really count. Otherwise, we haven't actually voided anything this 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 playthrough until now. It feels a little bit a little, a little bit of a shame that we're doing it, but we do have so much stuff down here that we just we don't have any use for that having a way of disposing of it does does make a certain amount of sense i have to admit and it looks like the bot frenzy has now more or less subsided so all of the in in the time i've been talking we've finished pulling up all of the stuff from over there except for the stations though those still need to go but i think we're going to get trains to pick up the resources from them from them first um so yeah we've managed to rip through all of that it's now been, all been brought back down to here and we can start the start the exciting process of crushing it down Last week I talked about the new oil area that uh, Mark had designed and, and, and built up, and so this this week he managed to get it, he managed to finish it and start it running. So the big change here is that we've gone over from having a massive area of um, of refineries and chemical plants that are doing everything quite slowly through lots and lots of machines to having a much smaller number of machines, and then putting these speed beacons with tier six speed modules in, in the middle of it. That's meaning each one of these machines is running, despite the fact it's running at plus twenty four percent productivity, is also running at almost six times. Times its normal speed, and so we're produce, we're produce, so this is able to produce the oil, all the oil products, much much more quickly. And then over here we've got tier six productivity modules and high and again lot high end speed modules as well, working on this entire area. And that gives us that another fifty six percent boost for each stage. So if we're producing heavy oil here, then we get another. So we, we get the twenty four percent here, then fifty six percent here, turning it into light oil. Another fifty six percent turning it into petroleum gas, and then we get loads and loads of the gas that we can then pump down here to make into all the things we need. And see, oh look there, they uh, a sulfur train has just left. That's for and a sulfuric acid train as well, so that's very convenient timing. So I can look down here, and you can see what I was talking about uh, last week, where I was saying even though even though we're feeding straight from the machines into the trains, we're still getting a really good speed of production over here. And this is despite a significant chunk of the um, of, of, of the sulphur going over down to the machines down here to be made into sulfuric acid to fill up these tanks. Even despite that, we're still filling this train up really, really quickly. I feel like this is almost as fast as we're filling them up when we had the full big oil production system. And we have so much potential for production here. You see, there we go. It's already filled up another train. That's, that train is now ready to go. We've got and we filled it, and we've also filled up these tanks. Down down here. So we now have a really, really high production rate for all of the things we need over here. Marcus said we are supplying these at a faster rate than we were doing before, despite having shrunk down from the, the massive systems you saw before down to this tiny little system up here and a few machines scattered throughout it all, all the way down here as well. He's done a couple of other minor little tweaks over here as well. For example, I believe this uh, th this speed beacon here has been moved into such a position that it's also covering the, uh, the, the, the um, solid fuel down here because we need that for something. I can't, I can't remember what we need solid fuel for, but but we do. So we're feeding it into a station here so it can be taken away. Uh, we also need it for rocket fuel so we can make ro extra rocket fuel here for anything anything rocket rocketry related. All the things have been made down here. And the exciting thing about this, or the impressive thing about this, is if I come up to the top here, if I copy copy this whole area, uh, so I've got it in, in, my, in my in my pace buffer, I can grab that, and then flick over to map mode. You can see over here, this is, this is the area that used to have the big oil area. And the entire system is about the same size as the stations, as the actual drop-off stations were in the old system. So you can see just how much space we've saved by switching over to this new system. I could probably fit it in again over here, especially if I rotated it and squeezed things around a bit. So there's room. So we've we've made it literally half the size, and as you can see over here, most of the space is taken up by the by all of the uh, the rail infrastructure that's required in order to get the trains in and out. We've now got this massive open area over here where we could potentially stick in a new production system if we needed to. I don't know what we're going to need that's going to be needed quite this close to the uh, the core of the factory, but in the future we could quite easily stick something in there. And uh, Mark says he's been pulling things out relatively slowly and carefully, sensibly, uh, so as not to waste it. So you can see here we have a huge quantity of liquid rocket fuel. Down here we have plenty of um, explosives. And so we need to pull these out, we need to use these up, and then once, they, once, they, once they've gone, once they've been used, and the same down here with light oil, once these have all been used up, then we can pull out these stations and just dis dismantle it and have this area be com then completely free, completely available. We could even fill in most of this lake with landfill, and then we've just got a huge piece of real estate over here that we could use for 
I don't know anything else we need to build. But we've got to that interesting phase of the game now where builds are getting really quite small. So you saw the example over here with the oil where it's gone from filling this whole area to just being this little area with this tiny patch of machines up at the top. Ages ago I did a similar thing with the data card substrates where, well this was the tier 2 factory uh, which is building it at a, a, a rate. We've got, we've got one blue belt coming out of here, maybe that's full, I'm not sure. Then up here we've got a much, much smaller factory but it's got the uh, it's got the speed, wide area speed beacon in the middle. It's only and this one's only using tier 3 modules, but this one is producing three blue belts coming out here. So you can see that this area, despite being so much smaller than this one, is producing at three times the rate. We previously had a massive area that was covering, I think, covering about this much space. Everything, everything that will fit on my screen now, pretty much. And that was producing more slowly than this was. So as you advance, as you move forward with the beacons and the productivity modules, and just generally making your individual better machines, you get so much more output that your factory actually starts to contract. So the factory must get smaller, but more efficient and more productive. And this is a thing that's happening all over the place. So when we did our, um, our iron smelting facilities up here, for example, steel making facilities, these are, I mean, these, these are actually still pretty big, but they're smaller than they would have been before. And if we, and we could advance this further, we could, we could probably, we could, could put better speed modules in here so we wouldn't need as many uh, casting machines. We could potentially put better modules in down here. We could switch over to the advanced furnaces. We could make, we could make this smaller if we wanted to. We don't need to at the moment. The system is working absolutely fine, but we could. And I pointed out and mentioned in the last video how every, over here the copper smelting facilities are using tier 2 productivity modules and tier 2 speed modules. And I think Mark might have taken that as a challenge because he's talked about talking about um, building up an improved version of this that's then going to be using the advanced chemical plants instead of these ones down here. Um, and so it's going to be, again, it'll be a smaller but more efficient, more productive system that's just going to work so much better in every possible way. Maybe that's something we could drop into this gap down here, although we'd find it would probably only be about this big. So... And the same, and we've done the same with the. Uh, I say we. Mark has done the same with the uh, with the circuit production down here. So you can see all of these things. The factory with these with these crazy powerful Crastorio two buildings and the crazily powerful uh, space exploration modules. You can just make everything smaller and smaller and smaller, but still producing stuff at the same rate and with and with faster and faster belts as well. I have to admit that personally, I probably wouldn't bother with a lot of this stuff at least until it became kind of necessary. But until until there was a reason to rebuild, perhaps because some wasn't fast enough or I didn't have enough input and therefore I wanted to switch to a more productive recipe I probably wouldn't have bothered doing a lot of these rebuilds but um, Mark is very uh, is very keen on improving the efficiency of, of these things so he's done a, done quite a lot of the work on these and to be honest, it, and it makes a big difference it is much more uh, much more powerful and much more and it's quite and, and also another another big advantage of it is the UPS savings so I think pulling up all of the machines from over here has probably helped our UPS now we're up 43 at the moment uh, when I when I last looked and was going and first decided to say this, we were on about 46. But still, I think we were on about 40 before. So this is still an improvement. And I think some of that improvement might have come from ripping up the big oil area around here, which was just, as I say, was putting a bit of a load on the on, on the computer systems. One thing that isn't quite finished over here, so this system is, it's a, it's a little bit of a working process, but it's mostly working. Um, however, the plastic we don't seem to be picking up from here yet. And I think that is because over in the core processing, we have an overflow system here where the, any excess coal gets passed through, and, and if it doesn't go into, this, if it won't fit into the station here, it gets passed over to here, where we turn it into plastic here. And so that means that it's a, little, it's a slightly more complicated system because rather than just making it in the small oil production area and going, yep, that's fine, that's what we need, we need to fit in a prioritization system that tells the trains to pick up from here first, or pick up from here by priority instead of from the new small oil area. Uh, and so. With LTN, that would be absolutely trivial, but because we don't have LTN, it's not quite so easy. Given that I'm not sure whether that we have any um, actual coal mines out there, we might possibly be able to get away with just picking the coal up from here by train, but I think, I feel like having this system over here as, a, as, a, as an overflow is probably useful and still a good thing to have. So that's going to be, I guess, Mark's first uh, first thing to do in the next in the next stream, is going to be to sort out the priority of all the plastic trains and make sure, and so make sure we can actually pick up plastic from here, which, I mean, and there is plenty of it here so this is this system is currently working but also make sure that when we need a bit more of it we can pick it up from the oil area 
Speaking of Mark and big fat pipes, he's also uh, done a, uh, and, and also of uh, upgrades and co uh, compression as well. He's also done a similar thing, at least in the blueprint editor, which you can tell by this uh, fetching checkerboard pattern here, uh, to, the, um, to the coolant system for, for the thermofluid. And so previously, we had systems like this, where we've got uh, lots and lots of lots and lots of these radiator machines with uh, beacons scattered in amongst them, but there's just these really long pipes running up the middle. And then I came in here and I did a botched job of an upgrade by shoving in a load of pumps down the middle of here to try and get the uh, get the thermofluid flowing a bit better. And in a few places that we've got some extra pipelines like this one here that's popping out halfway along to pass to give a little bit of extra uh, throughput onto onto the uh, warm thermofluid that's been passed around here. This is all a bit of a botched job onto something I'd already made and then needed, ended up needing to expand. This system is much better. So we've got the ducts, and these are massive, massive, really high throughput pipes um, running along. And those are running along the bottom of here. So we can stick a, a tank on the beginning of here, perhaps it's going to store an enormous amount of thermofluid. That can be shoved in, pumped down here, and we can then chill that down to being the, to the cool thermofluid, which, which will then flow back up the ducts back into, into the system up here. We've got some storage tanks and so on. And in order to make sure that there's always plenty of throughput, uh, he's putting for, for each one of these duct exhausts, he's got the, each of those has six pipes coming off it, and those are essentially each one of those is going off to a separate radiator. There's some funny business going on the middle in the middle here a little bit because the pipes are next to each other. But basically, each one is going off to a separate radiator to ensure that there's always plenty of throughput there and we can always have plenty plenty of flow and we're never going to have any problems. And then there's a, a speed beacon in the middle that's giving a, a massive speed boost to, to all of these. So as you can see, all of these are running at um, about almost four times their normal speeds. So they're running at about 14 and a half, which is plus 380 percent. So almost almost five times their normal speed rather. Then up here, we've got exactly the same sort of system set up with the uh, hypercoolers. So again, we've got the ducts bringing in the uh, the cool thermofluid along here, which has been pumped in. Now, because these are um, a little bit bigger and chunkier, he's, he's arranged this slightly differently so that they're only, there's only two machines running off each duct. I guess that's to compact the thing down a little bit to fit it all in uh, around a single beacon, although I suspect we could probably have fiddled with this a little bit and, and had extra pumps running off, extra pipes running off each of these, but it doesn't really matter. It, and then again, you've got exactly the same thing at the top. So these have th these have three ducts each, so that you're bringing in the cool, get it taking out the cold, but also bringing out warm, which then gets fed, fed back round. It goes through a one-way valve here, and then gets pumped back in again. Each of the intermediates has these uh, has these sort of systems with the uh, with the storage tanks where we're uh, making sure that we're only pumping it out if we've got less than 12,000 in the tank and we're only pumping it back in again if there's more than 13,000. And that means we, we should keep these tanks always somewhere in the middle at about 12, 13,000. And the reason we do this is because uh, depending on where, what which particular area you're looking at, some of them will require cool thermofluid, but some, will, some a few areas will produce a little bit of cool thermofluid. And you always have to be able to feed that back in and then pass it back round to be chilled back down to the colder levels of it. And that needs to be, absolutely needs to be a priority. Now I do notice that he doesn't have anything that's setting an absolute priority from this thing, that this this pump here, over what flows around here. However, I think that given the shape of the pipes, he's going to have a reasonable amount of prioritization coming from in here. Because we've got a pump in here pushing it from here into, into this piece of pipe, I think that one's probably going to take priority over what just naturally flows out of these. I'm not 100% sure of that, but I think it will probably be okay. It'll be interesting to find out, but I think it should be all right. And then we've got the same thing up here with these cables. And then up here, because you never produce uh, super super cooled from anything else, we can just chuck it out here, push it out into the pipes, and, uh, and that'll sort it out. And one of the areas that's going to be really useful, I think, is over here in deep space science because we can note, we can see over here that these systems are not working because there's a lot of because there's a lot of uh, warm thermofluid in the output here. Um, and I was going to say that just coming through here and replacing the outputs from here with ducts, maybe replacing the super cool and the uh, warm thermofluid pipes along here with ducts as well, so I can run up and down here much more quickly, is going to help quite a lot. However. And then I came up here and, and looked and discovered what the actual problem is. So it turns out the problem is here because we have 200,000 thermofluid, warm thermofluid in this tank. And that means that we're not able to return it back up this pipe fast enough. So it could be that the throughput and the, uh, and the pumping round rate is actually absolutely fine over here. So let's find out. Let's put in some, um, some, uh, some uh, space tiles here while we talk about what the actual, the actual problem is. So I believe what has happened is that we've put, suddenly put in a much higher demand on the super chilled thermofluid because we've, we've filled up lots of machines down here and we started pulling it through a bit faster. And that means 
the, the output buffers in these in these radiators here have been emptied. And so each of these should, in theory, store at least a thousand, maybe two thousand, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, in the output buffer as well. Uh, and so there would be an, a huge amount of um, thermofluid sunk into these into these buffers. However, that's then been passed through the rest of the system and chilled down to the supercooled thermofluid, which has then been warmed up and has been passed around here. And we're not cooling it fast enough in order to deal with that. And so this tank here has filled up completely, and that means we're not able to pump anything more out. We're not able to pump the warm thermofluid out of these machines down here. Now, there's a couple of ways to fix this. One is to put in another tank under here in, a, in order to allow the, the, these to push the thermofluid back in. And that will provide a very, very short-term fix um, and allow us to then get those, get all of the warm thermofluid out of there, pump it through here and, 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 um, and sort, out, sort out the problem in a sort of, as I say, in a rather temporary and short-term way. The problem, however, is that these radiators aren't pulling the warm thermofluid through fast enough in order to turn it into the cooler thermofluids in order to make that super chilled thermofluid that's being required by all of the tanks. So whilst this will help a little bit in the very, very short term if I do that, what I'll need to do in the long term is put in a lot more chilling along here, much far more chilling effects, and then maybe drop that in like that, which will then allow us to then start chilling the thermofluid down a lot more quickly and in theory, theory, more efficiently, more quickly, just get a lot more of it flowing through. And so on the one hand, that will pull out a large quantity of thermofluid immediately, because if we look at this, we've got um, 31 radiators going in, and each one of those radiators will immediately pull in a thousand warm thermofluid out of the uh, out of the pipe running up the middle. However, how, however, however, if we look at this pipe, we'll see it's empty along here. So the actual problem is that we're not pumping the, the uh, thermofluid through here quickly enough, and therefore, we need to we need to switch over to a Mark's new design that runs the ducts up the middle. And I've argued, I basically argued in a complete circle here. I've said that um, we didn't we didn't the, the problem here was because we weren't ducting it down up and down here. But no, it turns out that's not the problem. It's because we're not holding enough in here. But no, that's not the problem. It's because we're not chilling it fast enough. No, it turns out we just need to put in Mark's design here. So actually, I need to rip up all of this, put in a load more. Um, scaffolding because the new system is going to be a bit wider and a bit shorter and then I can put in Mark's system here that'll probably work knowing Mark it's probably going to work far more quickly than this system even with all of this extra stuff I've put in along here uh, and so just dropping it in there will probably solve all of the problems immediately because that's <laughs> to be honest Mark seems to be quite good at designing these things and that's, pro so that's probably just straight up what's going to happen. However, in the temp as, te as temporary fixes go that should now allow all of these to yes you can see that this is now draining reason uh, kind of effectively I think I think that is probably going down a bit uh, if we look along here all of these machines are now running so we are producing antimatter a bit quicker however we are very very quickly going to run out of the supercooled uh, thermofluid coming in here so like I said not going to be a proper fix we'll need to we'll, we'll need to use Mark's way of doing it a bajillion miles away out in Stardust, we are also having fluid problems, although these are slightly different. These aren't due to throughput. Uh, so let's, let's have a look at what's been going on over here. Last week, I talked about how I've been putting in some extra mines up here. So we've now got these four mines up here. It's all being dug up quite happily, put into stations, ready to be taken away by the trains. Great. So I finished this one up over here. I put in an extra two down here because they were so close to the main rail systems that I put in. It seemed it seemed kind of rude not to. That was, that was a really easy job. However... Having put in uh, about six or seven extra mines, each of those mines has a large tank here that needs to be filled up with sulfuric acid. Well, I say needs to be filled up. It needs to be filled up to 100,000. I've not, I've not filled them up. I've not been telling the trains to fill them all the way up to the brim. These pumps are set to stop unloading when they get down, when it gets to 100,000. So they'll, they'll fill it up to there, and then we can use the acid to mine up the, uh, the nacrotide, put it into the station, the trains can take it away. Great. The problem is that 700,000 uh, sulfuric acid that we need to make and ship out to all the stations. Over here we have a system where a spaceship will land and it will unload a certain amount of sulfur. And we're asking for about 10, we're trying to keep a buffer of 10,000 of it available. 10,000 sulfur is enough to make 100,000 sulfuric acid. So the entire buffer, if we turn it into sulfuric acid, is actually only enough to fill up one station. So given that the trains will, given that we are basically out of sulfuric acid, each, each spaceship should be bringing over about 10,000. But that means we need to have seven spaceships come over before we'll have enough to fill up all the stations. Plus, we're also using a bit of that acid to mine up the naquium. So it's going to be more than seven spaceships. You see, here we go. A spaceship has landed. We're getting some sulfur. That's going to help a bit, but we'll chew through it fairly quickly. 
And so the problem is that because we've been going out and filling up all these mining stations, the uh, the train the train over here doesn't have it doesn't have managed to fill up with sulfuric acid. If we look here, we can see it's full up to twenty six thousand. That's plenty to dig up a train's worth of naquitite. So let's send it on its way. You can clear off, and that means another train is then able to pull in, and we can then unload the naquitite from it. But this is going to have the same problem. This one's only got uh, twenty six thousand in it as well. So now, okay, now we start to make a little bit of the acid, so we can start the trains running again. Uh, this one, there we go, has actually managed to fill up. So so when a spaceship has just arrived, we have some sulfuric acid available. But then as the trains come back round, we we still don't we we're still a bit short of it. You saw that station we looked at, that mining station we looked at earlier, that only had uh, 50,000 in it or so. So one of these, two of these trains will be able to almost completely empty into it and then they'll come back down here and we won't have enough because we've only brought in 10,000, that's only making 100,000. And then we've got this, exactly the same thing going on up here. So this, this train is only up to 25,000 but that's plenty, we can send it on its way. Um, and then this one will pull in and it'll unload its nacre. And so all of this means that we have a shortage of, uh, we have a shortage of sulfuric acid and that's causing the train system to essentially break down is too strong a word because it does work but it doesn't keep the system running quite as nicely and that means that when the ship arrived I was going to say when the ship arrived we probably didn't have the uh, three warehouses full of uh, naquitite but it's gone again so maybe we actually did so here we can we can use up this sort of this all this all this sulfur can be used up while we wait for the next ship to come in which is not too far away actually we've got the dustier there so it's going to arrive in stardust fairly soon and it's and it's going to add to the sulfur but the thing is we are filling up some very very big buffers here because we each as I say each of these um, each of this new new mines I put in needs another sh spaceship to arrive to provide enough sulfur to provide all the acid to get it up to to, to idling and get it up to its sort of it's, it's sort of it's ready position and then we need another four spaceships to fill up the this tank and this tank and so you can see we're looking we're looking at eleven spaceships at this point, and then also because I put in all of these extra um, extra extra mines, and I wanted some extra trains. So now out here in 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 Stardust, we have seven trains doing doing the run out to the Naquitite stations. We have eleven Naquitite pickup stations. So actually, I want some more trains because I want ideally I would like to have as many trains as I have stations because I think that seems like quite a good idea. Um, but to, in order to get that to work nicely, I think I probably also need to buffer the trains when they come out of here. It's it's a whole th or, or alternatively I need to just set up the stations to always accept a train. It's, all, it's a bit of a thing. There's a lot of expansion needed in order to get this system working as nicely as I would like it to. But making more trains means, again, you need more sulfuric acid because each train is a running is a running buffer of an additional 30,000. So for every three trains I make, that's another spaceship. So now we're looking at probably getting on for about 15 spaceships need to loop through before the system will, be, will have filled up all its buffers and will then just start running nicely as we want it to. We also have a little bit of load placed on the uh, iron production that's being taken up by the by the acid here. I don't think that's a t that's too too serious a problem. We have this train over here that has come come down and is is filling up from a small mine down here. It, hmm. I'm a little bit concerned that how much have we got? We've got 183,000 iron ore down here. And so if we're getting through sulfur in 10,000 at a time, then that means we'll be getting through iron plate 2,000 at a time. 183,000, that is going to last a while. But I am going to need to think about potentially finding another iron patch out here somewhere. And it's possible there'll be another decent sized iron patch. If I do a search for iron, we'll, um, well, we'll see, what we, see what we find. Okay, so there are some sizable patches out here. Um, this hasn't helped very much for finding them. Uh, let's let's look for let's look for, let's look have, have have a look for one of the big ones. Oh, I see they're sorted by distance. That's very convenient. So there's 1.1 million here. So it would be relatively easy to run a train out, to run add this one onto the train system, add this onto the train system, and have have a train running out here to grab the grab the iron from there. Or there's four and a half million just down here, which to be honest, actually that I could just extend this railway line and keep my keep my one to one train going. So yeah, there is there is a decent amount of iron out here. I'm not going to have too much trouble expanding out and getting more of that. So, uh, I, but it is it is something I need to be aware of, something I need to consider as we continue to expand the uh, expand the factory. It's also worth mentioning that in order to help a little bit with the uh, with the acid production, especially given the number of extra trains I was adding in, I dropped them all down to having a single fluid wagon on the back of it because I massively overestimated the amount of acid that was going to be required for digging up nacre previously <laughs> so now we've yeah we have one wagon on the back and that meant I was able to have a, um, a very short-term fix where I pumped the acid out of the back two wagons before I demolished them and that put it back into the tank and so we had we had a little bit of extra throughput from that and I have to admit, the system does seem to be working quite well at the moment. We're pumping through all the acid out of these. The 10,000 in there is easily enough to top this back up again. The trains are running well, and if we look at the stations down here, you can see that they are bimbling through quite merrily. That train is having a 
whale of a time doing whatever route it, whatever route it was taking there. Uh, the trains are running quite happily, and if we look down here, how are we doing on the production? So we're, we've, we've almost half filled the um, the warehouses over here. I, I, I don't know. It, 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 it's kind of, as I say, we're still filling up buffers, kind of on a bit of a bit of a bit a little bit unbalanced. But I think as things as things carry on, we will get to a point where the system is going to just work. Tm. The other problem I ran into out in Stardust was I started to run a bit worryingly short of power. So if we have a look at the power graph over time, you can see that yeah, at the moment we're using 1.2 gigawatts, and that is pretend, that was in, that would have been problematic before because down here we have we have this beam receiver down here that's feeding into a couple of uh, high temperature heat exchangers. These are worth 500 kilowatts each, 500 megawatts each, and then into this high temperature turbine generator which produces a gigawatt and then a smidge more from these two up here. And so yes, we're using 1.2 gigawatts that's a problem. So in order to fix that I've put in an additional uh, two copies of this essentially down here where we've got another two heat exchangers here and another two here each of which is feeding into another high temperature uh, turbine and so now we have the potential to produce three gigawatts of power and so everything is fine. Uh, there are a couple of provisos here however the first one is how do you get the water out of it? Because the, all of these these are all condensing turbines. So these ones will turn the, these will take in steam and then they'll produce uh, they'll produce a load of a load of uh, medium temperature steam which goes to these condensing turbines and some water as well, which then you have to deal with. And so I've put I've hooked up these these pipes in here in the middle, and then I was going. Now what do I do with this water? How am I going to get it out? Can I? And none of my under, none of my underground pipes are long enough to hop under here. Am I going to have to make some ducts or bring out ducts? But no, it turns out fortunately you can actually pump water straight through heat exchangers. They're like uh, boilers. In fact, they basically are boilers. They're just an advanced type of boiler. They get the heat from exter externally, and so I'm able to pump the water back out through there to send it back through all of these turbine uh, heat exchangers up here and put it back into the water tanks over here. So that means everything is working fine. We can, we have a return path for the water. So this system. I did manage to squeeze this in and get it working. If we need more power beyond this, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do. I guess it might have to involve Naquium heat pipes, um, because you can't transfer 10,000 degree heat through normal heat pipes. But Naqu and some Naquium heat pipes perhaps coming off the top of here, and then another set of turbine generators over here. And so it is manageable, but we are able to generate about two and a half times the amount of power we need. My other concern with this is how the temperature over here is going to be holding up. Now at the moment we're at 9,995 degrees. It is, also, it is going up very gradually at the moment, so it seems to be all right. But over at the other end in Kalidus orbit, we have this beam uh, tr transmitter here that has an emitter strength of 13 gigawatts and a transmission efficiency of about 10%. So I'm worried that as if I expand any further, if I go past 1.3 gigawatts at the other end, this isn't going to be able to keep up. And so at that point, well, I might need to put, I'm, I'll need to put some more of these energy beam injectors in, which means we're going to need a load more of the um, solar panels out here. It's all going to become another, a whole big thing. It's just going to need a lot more expansion, a lot more extra building, and yeah. We are, at the moment, this is fine, TM. However, if we're getting through about 1.3 gigawatts and we're using about... Okay, it's dropped now down to 700 megawatts again, um, probably because a lot of the mining drills have kicked out. But if, we, if we're gonna if we're gonna be spiking at uh, 1.2 gigawatts, and we may expand further, and I don't know why the system has stopped. I bet it's because yes, we've run out of, yeah we've run out of sulfur to make acid at this point, so the trains have stopped again. So all the mines are shut down, and they're what use all the power. So you know it's a this is this is this is the, this is what I'm talking about. But once we have once we've had those 15 spaceships arrive that I've been talking about, once we have enough sulfur, then the system is probably going. Then we're going to be, get have the system in a point where we're going to be running a bit more solidly, maybe using, if it gets up to 1.5 gigawatts, then we're going to start pulling out a bit more power than we can provide. So some further expansion may be required. I am wondering a bit if I should up the uh, sulfur request a bit, because this is currently the limiting factor and the pain in the wasp name. So let's see. The, the worry is that if I order too much sulfur, that it might fill up all of the storage systems, uh, and we don't and we don't want that because if we fill up if we fill it up too much, then we could start having trouble getting the iridium and the enriched vulcanite and the vulcanite out of the out of the warehouses up here because it might get jammed up in, in here if we fill this one up completely. So there are a few things I could do here. One is to just is to set up each of these to only have one um, belt bringing out sulfur from these warehouses and the other one bringing everything else, assuming there's everything else isn't too many other things, which it might well be. Uh, and then or the other thing is to consider how many ships worth of stuff we can bring. So so. The entire 10,000 uh, sulfur that we're requesting in one go is two, is 200 stacks. So that would be seven and a half ships worth in these two warehouses and then another half up here. So I could probably, so call it eight ships before I start to have any sort of problems with storing it. And I think I'm on about five ships at the moment. So I could increase this request over here a bit, maybe from 10 to 15. 
15. That'd be pushing it a little bit, but that might be possible. And that would get that would get us that extra bit of space that uh, we kind of I could kind of do with. Um, hmm. It's a little bit. It is a bit fiddly, and I'm worried about overfilling these and then having the problems that we've seen in the past before. Uh, I could potentially put in another warehouse here and get a little bit, and get a bit more storage space. There are or more over here. There there are ways round it, but it's going. But it's yeah, a little bit problematic. Or maybe just have a couple of ships bring out a bit more and just keep it, baby it a little bit, and to make the, make sure the right amount comes out. That said, on the other hand. That spaceship did depart pretty damn quickly after it had finished unloading, after it had finished unloading the sulphur. So, I feel like we might have just about enough Naquatite being produced and going into here that when the ship arrives, we do we can pretty much just straight load it straight straight away in one go. So maybe things are okay. Maybe it's it's kind of hard to say. And I think I've waffled around this subject for long enough now, so I need to move on to something else. <laughs> I talk about how the how the combat is going pretty much every week, but that is because the guys have been making, and by the guys I mean Tristan and Mark, have been making steady um, inroads into the biter population. So this stream, uh, Tristan started off just before the stream started because it's a horrendous lag generator, uh, by dropping a couple of the um, the anti-biter capsules. And that means that it, it, it degenerates all the biters down to earlier levels of biters. If I look over here, you can see we don't have anything above large biters. There's no behemoths around anywhere. Uh, well, okay, there's some behemoth worms, but there are no behemoth biters. And so that makes things makes it a lot easier to go out and do 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 the combating and and and, and deal with the biters. And so as part of that, uh, I think Tristan went out to help Mark rather than uh, rather than carrying over on over on the east side. So now they've managed. To, it looks like over here they've managed to push the biters all the way back up to here. So there's a load of um, there's a load of laser turrets down here that can be got rid of. We we've now got our front line is now. In fact, that's a huge lake. That is a wonderful bottleneck down um, here. So we've got a little bit. So we've got a little bit of land here that we need to protect, well, which, we, which we're doing from over here, and then a, sort of across this bit here. This is now our sort of our front line. This 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 tiny crossing point, and then across here. So with only a little bit more effort, we could get a line. We could, we could draw a line there uh, across across here, and a line across here, and that would be a wonderful choke point that would keep the entire western hemisphere, western hemi semicircle, uh, free of biters. And then over on this side, well, this is slightly less organised, but slightly less neat because of the way Tristan's been doing things. But again, if he wipes them out along along this area on this side, then the only places we would need to defend here would be across here, and I suppose across here. And we'd be defending most of the eastern eastern flank as well. Um, we'd still need to be defending the north, but I think before, but, they're, but they're probably not bothering with that because it's not going to be that much longer until they've swept round the top from either one side or the other, or possibly both simultaneously, and completely uh, eliminated biters from the entire north half of the planet. Uh, there are still a few down on the southern half as well, but you know we're at the point now where we have quite advanced, where we have advanced um, personal defense lasers, we have advanced power generation, we have advanced all of the sort of combat stuff, and we don't have advanced biters anymore. We've regressed all the biters down to down to much earlier levels. So going through and killing them all off is relatively easy, and so they've been doing. Uh, that, as I say, that's why they've been making these huge swathes of progress up here. It hasn't been uh, completely without issues though. Uh, Tristan has dis discovered that his uh, laser, his high power lasers are using up a an enormous amount of power. So he's ended up putting six portable fusion reactors into his armor to run five personal laser defenses, and he's still struggling. So there's a crazy, crazy amount of power draw on those. Looking in here, you can see he's doing 1600 damage, but it's taking eight megajoules per shot, uh, which is a, an, a maximum consumption of 10 megawatts, which is well, that, that, that's a lot. And he's running with portable fusion reactors, which which have a power output of 3 megawatts. So you can see how these numbers don't quite add up, can't you? That means basically each one of those lasers requires three of these fusion generators to power it. And yes, okay, you can you can you can use the batteries to an extent. Um, this this battery here stores 150 megajoules, which is going to be enough to keep one of his lasers running for about 10 seconds. So <laughs> It's no wonder that he finds that six portable fusion reactors, presumably some batteries and five lasers, uh, seems to be seems to be struggling a little bit. But with enough flying around between between assaults, it might give you time to charge your batteries back up. That is a ridiculous amount of power. <laughs> no one, no, I say, no wonder he's struggling a bit. Spectacularly, the submachine lasers. Okay, they use less energy per shot, but they're rapid fire weapons, so they actually use fifty percent more power overall as well. This is this is crazy, crazy power consumption. I can see why he's struggling a bit. Mark had issues a couple of times while he was doing the, doing the the, uh, the fighting over here. So he's had we've got a couple more of these uh, tags out here 
in the, in the distance. Uh, and these seem to be from, as far as as far as we can tell, he was killed by acid splash, which we believe means getting knocked. You get knocked when you get knocked out of the air by any sort of biter or more likely spitter attack, and then you accidentally stand in the goo for slightly too long, or the goo is at least the last bit of does the last bit of damage, and that's what pushes you over the edge. So another couple of deaths over there. So you know, f in chat and all of that. Um, but you know, he's cleared quite a lot of area for those. Um, but he did on one of those deaths, he did uh, need Tristan's help to go out and recover his body because it was too. It was in a slightly too bitery area. So Tristan was. Tristan came out there. I'm not sure exactly how Mark got out there. Maybe 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 he rode out on Tristan. Tristan with sort of piggybacks that type of thing, um, <laughs> or maybe maybe he borrowed a, got got a car or something from somewhere because it's a long walk out 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 here to get your get your body when things have gone gone that wrong. Uh, but Tristan was able to come out and wipe out the biters that caused the problem and to to, uh, to allow him to carry on. <laughs> Tristan says he's also done some clearing out in the southeast, so maybe this line, maybe this line's been pushed a bit further forward, or maybe it's this area down here. It's probably this area down here that he's uh, made safe. And so yes, we can now we can now have another front line across there if we wanted it. But again, there's no point in putting in the big lasers and having the front lines and things because the two of them are now with with all of the high high tier weaponry they've got, they're just so lethal. They honestly they don't really need uh, the, la the 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 um, backup from the uh, laser turrets. They can just push through and do and do all the damage themselves. That said, I did hear Tristan ask about rail guns, and I think that's probably for the behemoth worms because those are, those are by far the toughest things that remain. Uh, as you can see, this one here has seven and a half thousand health, and that's a lot when you compare it to a spawner here, which has seven hundred and fifty health. Okay, that's less actually less of a difference than I was expecting. It's only ten times as much, but it still it makes it makes them a bit of a pain to kill off, um, and it's, it's far more than any of the biters. We actually, even a we've got a behemoth biter up here. I didn't think we had any of those, but apparently we've uh, they, they've managed to develop a new one. Even these guys only have 5,000 health. So, yes, dealing with the behemoth worms is a, is a bit of a mission. So uh, he was looking looking into the possibility of taking out a railgun as well for taking out sort of the, the biter nests and the, and the worms and so on. So maybe he'll do that and, that and that'll help a bit. That's pretty much everything I have to say. Tristan has also, as you can see by the fact his spaceship is out here, done a little bit more power expansion out in your bit uh, over uh, over Njord. And uh, this is because the uh, this is due to the again the the update from Space Exploration whatever version to the new one where it make where it, where it punishes quite a lot of the Earth uh, the Crastorio two stuff uh, by making and, and for the advanced buildings it makes them take a lot more power. And so there were a lot of those buildings down on Njord, and so we needed a lot more power over here. So Tristan has put in some expansion there. That brings us on to the death counter, and as I mentioned, uh, Mark got unlucky a couple of times out here and got got gooped. Uh, so that brings him up to a little bit up, up up the rankings. He's still way behind Mark, and Tristan is still obviously not not uh, he's st is still being clearly being very very careful and uh, and not 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 getting taken out by the biters. It looks like so uh, well done there, I guess. But um, I, I still think you need a few more deaths to bring you to help you catch up with the rest of us a little bit. <laughs> Over on the research side, we managed to get some stuff done this week because uh, we had Naquium, was it Naquium we're short of? Whatever whatever it was we didn't have, we managed to get it flow, up, up and flowing again. So uh, that's going at least uh, reasonably well. We managed to, So we managed to finish off the Bio Strength Upgrade 5, which appears to be the last one. There aren't any, aren't any more after that one by the looks of it. Uh, so we're as strong as we're ever going to be. And that means, that gives us a little bit of extra carrying capacity, a little bit more inventory space, which is useful. You, you know me, my inventory always tends to fill up with nonsense quite a lot of the time. So having a bit more space in there is going to be incredibly useful. It seems to have been the lowest priority of the bio upgrades because we did all the rest of them, all the other ones first. Um, so what else do you get? Intelligence is definitely the most important because that gets you lab research productivity so that pays for everything else you might ever do. Dexterity, character crafting speed, we don't really care about that at this stage because we've got, we mostly don't handcraft anymore with the exception of perhaps me making those long pipes. Increasing health is probably pointless because most of our health comes from shields and armor these days. And increase, but increasing character speed is sort of useful. So I guess I think speed and strength are probably similarly useful. Intelligence is obviously is definitely the, by far the most important. Dexterity and constitution, I would say, are the are lesser, lesser, lesser importance. But clearly, Tristan, who's been managing our research, disagrees because he he, he put strength in as, as the absolute last one. So um, sure, I, I don't really care too strongly either way. We have researched nutrient enrichment, which seems like a very, very odd thing to do because it, by looking at the science packs required and the number of them, I feel like this is a very, very early on <laughs> research that we should have done. Uh, it gets us fertilizer, which we can then use to uh, to to to, to, re to uh, make biological stuff a bit more efficiently. I'm wondering if this was something that was added in in the update, and that's why we hadn't picked this one up before, or whether we just decided we didn't care about it and we're happy with the slightly more expensive recipes. 
Either way, we have now done it, and so that makes that means we can now make fertilizer. Yay! We've researched advanced matter liberation. Now this is this is an exciting and an important one because this is the one that I was using in, uh, that I was talking about in yesterday's video that allows me to turn stone into particle stream. And this is ne so we've ne now that we've researched that, that's how I've been able to move away from the old rather inefficient and slow re method of making particle stream into the new one that is working so much better and is a sixth of the price. So this is a fantastic one to have researched. But the fact that we've only just researched it and as you can see it requires deep space science one is why we've only just started using the new improved better recipe for it we have researched life support equipment four because it was there and we thought we might as well i suppose i don't see any other real reason for us to have done that um, better life support seems to essentially increase the um how long each individual life support canister lasts for now life support canisters are really really cheap so personally i haven't bothered upgrading the life support in any of my suits so yeah i just haven't bothered it doesn't see it doesn't didn't seem that worthwhile an upgrade uh, and that is relatively expensive to make. As you see, it requires lattice pressure vessels. It requires self-sealing gel. Uh, we don't have the latter of those yet, I don't think. We don't, certainly don't have Naquim Tesseracts. Uh, number three takes vitalic reagents and aerofrain bulkheads. Okay, those are quite easy to get hold of at this stage. Maybe I should maybe I should upgrade to a Mark III uh, life support pack because I did at one point like in the last stream I did notice that I was running a little bit low on life support cans and had to go and get some more. So maybe uh, maybe it'd be worth it. It not not that big a deal though. I don't think. We have unlocked advanced matter processing, which gives us the uh, matter stabilizer and the charged matter stabilizer. Um, oh, and I see, and then unlocks all of these recipes along here, which allow us presumably to turn matter back into other things. So we could, for example, if we decided we wanted to, we could turn matter into iridium. Or at least into it, we're not even into iridium, we could turn matter into iridite, which we would then have to process into iridium. So this is. It's a nice idea, but the problem is, as you can see, this recipe, turning matter into iridite, also requires the charged matter stabilizers, and they gradually get used up. And producing those requires Naquium Tesseracts, AI cores, um, and a basic matter stabilizer. You can see how it's kind of expensive. There's a lot goes into these things, including another AI core and a broad matter catalog. So these are, these are expensive things to make. So I feel that we're going to be better off just digging it out of the ground. I think going full matter economy, I think, is not going to work. I have a feeling that this is the matter is a Crastorio 2 thing that has been heavily, heavily nerfed by space exploration uh, in order to basically stop you just going, well, in that case, I'll turn all of this stone that I'm digging up on Norvis into matter and then turn that into all of the exotic things we need and just make everything on Norvis and not have to go anywhere. Uh, Granted, it's a very, very late game research, but still, I can see the logic there of nerfing it quite heavily so you can't just make it, uh, so you can't just turn matter into everything and everything into matter and just have things swapping back and forth. It doesn't really fit in with the, with the ethos of space exploration. Finally, we've done zone discoveries from 166 to 170. Uh, that's just finding more planets out there, and, the, and we're just doing. We're going to carry on doing these until we can't find any more planets. They're, we're not finding anything useful, but it, 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 it's a completionist thing, I guess. <laughs> and now we're, we're working on rocket reusability 17 because we haven't finished it and it's a non-infinite research that we want to finish. So it's just really, really expensive at 131,000. To be honest, I think we should probably cancel that and do and do important things, things that we actually want, and then come back to these sort of things and try and finish them off a bit later on when we've just got the time and when there aren't other researches that we want to be getting on with. Uh, but you'll have to come along and uh, see the stream tomorrow to find out whether we actually do that or not. <laughs> so, speaking of, I shall be back again tomorrow for, for the uh, the next part of the stream where I shall be going out and trying to try, uh, staring at Stardust and going, why aren't you better? Just trying to get the whole system up and working as well as I possibly can, fixing all of the other problems we've looked at and just trying to push, carry on further on with the various types of science that we're working on. I'll then also be back on Wednesday for another satisfactory stream where I should be carrying, again, carrying on with that. I'm, I'm building out little towns, which is a very, very Factorio way of playing satisfactory and is a little bit frustrating because I can't copy and paste quite as much as I'd like to. But I do have blueprints, which has helped a little bit. I just wish, make, wish you could make much, much bigger ones. So that's, that's going along okay. I'm get, I think I'm getting slightly gradually better at it. Come along and uh, w w watch how things are going and uh, tell me what you think I should do differently. And then, of course, I'll be back again next weekend with some more of these, uh, with these videos as well, updating you on the last stream. So, as ever, thank you very much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.